Good morning and welcome to all. Now, we're here first to dispute the old saw that says we have to stop meeting like this. <laughs> we're here to say to the House and the Senate, we're going to keep meeting like this until you stop interfering with the local laws of the District of Columbia or grant statehood, whichever comes first. Okay. <laughs> we're very serious about why we're here today. And we've done some serious work in the past, and it has paid off, and we're going to do that again. So I want to thank uh, Mayor Bowser and our speakers for joining us once again. Uh, in order to make clear that the District of Columbia will simply not tolerate interference with its local laws. I particularly appreciate the local and national coalition who assist us so that the Congress knows we are not in this alone. Now, some of them will speak today, but I do want you to have the names of all of them who work with us there are so many of them that they switch in some, some years. Uh, uh, one group speaks on a particular notion uh, or issue, and the next year, another one who also uh, is also involved in that issue speaks. So we are grateful because many of them are in attendance today, even when they're not speaking, to the American Civil Liberties Union, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, the Brady Campaign, the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence, Compassion and Choices, D.C. Cannabis Campaign, D.C. Vote, D.C. Water, Death with Dignity National Center, Guttmacher Institute, Marijuana Policy Project, NARAL, uh, uh, Pro-Choice America, National Association of Clean Water Agencies, National Women's Law Center, Planned Parenthood, Water and Water uh, Environment uh, Federation. Now you're going to hear from some of these representatives of some of these organizations. But you see how long it took me to read that list? Uh, that shows you both how much interference that there is and how much support we have. Now, despite having an all-Republican Congress for the past three years, with the help of our partners, we have beat back most of the riders uh, that come in repeated and relentless uh, efforts. Um, last Congress, to keep score, we defeated 26 attempts to block or overturn D.C. gun laws. Uh, we need this coalition to continue to build this record. Uh, we are used, and that's the only word for it, in two different ways. First, often as political fodder for controversial national issues and issues which the member back home supports. An uh, example of that is the gun safety laws, which are a favorite of members of the House and Senate for interference. And then there's the other set of issues. Because the district is a progressive jurisdiction, it is often out in front of some, air, some other parts of the country. So we are used as a launching pad for outside groups for such issues, issues like medical aid in dying, for example. This year, <laughs> remember, we have a Republican House, Senate, uh, and President, although I must pause uh, to give some credit to President Trump for putting in his budget D.C. tuition access grants. But in his budget, he has tried to repeal death with dying. I think, it, yeah, death with dying. So <laughs> what he gives with one hand and will take the money, he tries to take from district law with another. Now, of the attacks, three have a head start because they are already now embedded in the 2018 
appropriation bill when it came out of committee. They are ones that we're all used to, forbids us from spending money on abortions for low-income women, uh, as is done throughout the United States. We were able to get this off of our appropriation when the Democrats were in power. It came right back when the Republicans took control. And also embedded uh, is the marijuana commercialization uh, rider. Now, we do have, we were able because we found a flaw in, in another rider to keep possession of marijuana intact. But they continue to put in the appropriation bill a rider, it's interesting they don't put that one in any longer, but they continue to put in appropriation a bill that would keep the mayor and the city council uh, from, from regulating marijuana. You want to keep marijuana out of the hands of children. You want to have the regulations that are appropriate. Can't do that because they can't touch it. Uh, and, of course, they can't commercialize uh, marijuana so we don't get whatever benefit and people are still on the streets uh, selling marijuana. Those are in there along with, are in our appropriation, along with another attempt to overturn the, the district's budget autonomy rep referendum. <laughs> now, that, that's interesting. We've been able to save the referendum, uh, but it is, it is as if the Congress is... Um, uh, doesn't quite know what to do uh, because the Senate won't uh, wipe out the budget autonomy referendum, but then the House and the Senate appropriate our funds. So we're halfway there and we're going to fight until we have budget autonomy for the District of Columbia without any interference and, and without our budget coming to the Congress of the United States. So we already know that these three writers are in and must be removed. But we also know that these three probably are not it. For example, as, as almost as soon as the House and Senate opened, there were gun bills in our law, in the House and in the Senate, to repeal our gun safety laws. And in, in, in all aspects, or virtually all aspects, including assault weapon uh, pro prohibition, large capacity magazines, and our registration requirement, this in the capital of the United States, to repeal all of that, and to, to, to for good measure, to keep the district from passing any gun laws of any kind, any time in the future. Um, I want you to bear in mind that our gun laws have been attacked in the Congress, uh, sorry, in the courts, and they have withstood uh, those attacks. So we know they're constitutional. Uh, most shameful is uh, the bill that has been introduced by my colleague Thomas Massey of Kentucky the very day after the shooting of our colleague, the whip, Steve Calise, members of the Capitol Police and other members of Congress, uh, a bill that exploited this incident uh, to recognize out-of-state concealed carry weapons. Uh, regardless of the standards that those states use to conceal and carry. And there are states that say you can keep conceal and carry at will, and there are states that say you can conceal and carry if you do A, B, and C. Massey's bill says ignore that. If you can conceal and carry in any state, you can come to the nation's capital and conceal and carry. So you can understand why this bill has to get our priority attention. Um, but there are new riders. Um, there, there's a medical aid. These are new here. And they're new in the country, or virtually new in the country. But not all together. Um, medical aid in dying, for example, and wet wipes in the district. I never believed I'd have to talk about wet wipes standing at a podium in the Congress of the United States. 
But let's start with one that has no laughing matter, death with, our Death with Dignity Act. This, this is a controversial bill. And the district had hearings and heard from all sides. Uh, the House and the Senate uh, tried to stop this bill. The House passed a disapproval resolution we were able to keep from going to the floor. The Senate didn't take up the bill. Uh, why? We believe we've been successful, and this does show you the hypocrisy that is flying here in the House, but it seems to have had an effect here. Uh, we believe we've been successful though, so, thus far. We don't count on that success. We got to keep fighting because 24 Republicans, including two House leaders, come from states which have death and dignity. Despite that, others have, in fact, tried to overturn it in the District of Columbia, did not get to the uh, House floor. Uh, it was not taken up in the Senate. We think that is a good omen. Now let's go to wet whites. <laughs> wet wipes. They have brought in powerful multinational coalitions, uh, corporations on that one, led by Kimberly Clark. They're lobbying members of Congress to block the district's law regulating personal hygiene products. Um, and in this case, it's, it's the white, wet wipes law. Well, a combination of lobbying and perhaps campaign contributions may produce members willing to actually stand up in the Appropriations Committee and come forward with a rider. Um, this law is, you know, <laughs> worth laughing at. This attempt is worth laughing at until you bear in mind why the district passed this law for the District of Columbia nationwide up to a billion dollars of taxpayer funds uh, are spent uh, because these wet wipes clog up sewers, drainer, drains, toilets, and the like. Look, we're also mindful of two other bills that we've been able to save that may come up against the Reproductive Health Non-Discrimination Act, which, which is the district's law that prohibits employers from discriminating against employees or their spouses based on their reproductive health sele selection. You would think that, 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 that they would not be as determined as they have been, um, but in fact, they, they, there's been a disapproval resolution on that, and therefore they may come back to try to do, do it with a, with, with a rider. And then there's the, 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 the Human Rights Amendment uh, that uh, the district passed to allow LBGT students equal access to school facilities. We beat at that in the past, but it may uh, come back. Um, you will hear in greater detail a few minutes from each of our representatives uh, about our efforts to defeat these riders. Uh, we're not alone. Not only do we have our coalition, we have members of, of the Senate and the House who stand side by side with us and with Mayor Bowser, and with the D.C. Council, and with D.C. residents to keep the Congress, an unaccountable Congress, from uh, overturning the duly enacted laws of the District of Columbia. I'd like to ask um, Mayor Muriel Bowser uh, to come forward at this time and thank her for coming. Good morning, everybody. And I, I want to thank the Congresswoman for inviting me here today and for always um, bringing us together on this day to remind us uh, and challenge us uh, at the same time. She's reminding us of the work that she does uh, on the Hill every day to preserve um, the rights of the District of Columbia and the rights of the legislature and the executive uh, to enact the laws of the district and to uh, enforce the laws of the district. I certainly wish we didn't have to have this conference every year, um, but am also uh, steadfastly uh, committed to making 
making sure that Washingtonians, taxpaying Americans that we are, uh, have every right that every American does. I also want to take this opportunity to uh, remind uh, the, the Congress of the United States just who we are in Washington, D.C. Uh, first of all, we take care of ourselves. Uh, we are a self-governing and self-sustaining entity here. Uh, we welcome uh, just about a 1,000 people to the district each and every uh, month. Uh, we welcome businesses that are thriving in our city. Our city has been the safest and is the safest that it's been in years. Uh, we have balanced 23 consecutive budgets. We have uh, 22 clean audits, and in the last two years, no material weaknesses found in those audits. We are a good government, uh, and we are running our city effectively. Budget autonomy is the law of the land, uh, and we have made in the last two years historic investments in affordable housing, um, public education, uh, and in the type of economic development that is creating jobs for D.C. residents and driving down unemployment in our city. Uh, that's good. That's a good government, and that's good news for the people of Washington, D.C. Uh, but despite these many successes every year, as the appropriation season uh, heats up, we are reminded uh, that we lack the rights of every other American in the 50 states. Uh, Washington, D.C. is home to more than 670,000 people. We pay $26.4 billion in federal taxes, $26.4 billion. Uh, and uh, we pay more capita uh, than 22 states, uh, yet we lack the same voting representation in this uh, home of democracy uh, that every other American does. Uh, we are the largest. We are uh, one of the largest local economies and most robust local economies in the nation. Uh, at more than 12.5 billion dollars, uh, our budget is larger than that of 15 states, uh, and that should be uh, it should be emphasized as well. We are the heart and soul and engine of this region, one of the most competitive regions, also anywhere in the United States. Uh, the riders that the Congresswoman uh, mentioned don't do anything to make D.C. better. Uh, they don't do anything to support the 670,000 people who live here, to strengthen our neighborhoods, our small businesses, or to strengthen our schools. Instead, they are designed uh, to influ influence the choices of Washingtonians and to question um, the, the ability of the legislature to pass the laws uh, that our city needs. The kind that limits as we've already heard, reproductive choices uh, that overturn the will of the voters when it comes to uh, the regulation of marijuana in our city, uh, and that would funda fundamentally make our city less safe, less inclusive, less diverse, and would undermine our very robust human rights law for which we are very proud. Uh, so today we are here to tell the Congress uh, that there are uh, many things and many federal things that that they can pay attention to, not the ones that I just mentioned. Those are local issues, and we'll take care of those. Um, but the metro system, uh, we think that the federal government needs to pay its fair share. Um, there's a bridge over the Potomac that belongs to the National Park Service. It needs $200 million. Um, there are parks all over the city uh, that need their attention as well. Uh, so while we, we want to tell the Congress not to mind our business, um, but there's certainly federal business that they can take care of. Uh, we also are mindful of the fact that there are D.C. values that uh, we have to uh, stand up for, speak up for, and uh, preserve and protect. And so we will continue uh, to do exactly that. I also uh, want to make this point, and I hope that the Congresswoman agrees with me. Uh, certainly we have, uh, and she has been here uh, in similarly situated times where she has delivered uh, for the residents of the District of Columbia. Uh, but now I think that we are more prepared than even we thought we were to deal with the types of challenges that we face. The challenges are significant, but the will of Washingtonians is too. Thank you, Congresswoman.
Of course, Mayor Bowser, I disagree with every word of what you said. <laughs> because you're speaking for all Washingtonians. There's no dissent on the issues you just named. The mayor in, uh, mentioned D.C. vote. I, I want you to imagine that uh, this bill goes to the floor. And if it goes to the floor, there could be amendments. Among those amendments could be amendments to strike down the laws of the District of Columbia. Then there would be a vote. And then every member in that chamber could vote except the member representing the District of Columbia. That is why we are insisting upon becoming the 51st state of the United States of America. <laughs> we are enormously grateful to the National Coalition who can reach to members of Congress uh, in our behalf for coming. And we're going to begin with uh, NARAL Pro-Choice America. And I'm going to ask Kate Ryan to come to the podium now. Good morning. My name is Kate Ryan. I'm with NARAL Pro-Choice America. I want to begin by thanking Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton for having me. Um, it is great to be standing here with the mayor and fellow progressive allies. NARAL is proud to be here fighting against attacks on the reproductive freedom of women in D.C. As a woman and someone who will clearly be a mom any day now, um, I'm tired of anti-choice Republicans in Congress who want to shove their extreme ideology into my personal life. Republicans in Congress want to roll back the huge steps D.C. has taken toward reproductive freedom by sneaking unnecessary restrictions on abortion access into totally unrelated legislation. Republicans have taken it upon themselves to ban D.C. from using its own locally raised funds for abortion services, denying basic health care for women in need. Republicans have also consistently attacked D.C. non-discrimination laws one that simply protects women from being discriminated against at work because of our reproductive health choices. I think we can all agree that no one deserves to be fired for taking birth control, having an abortion, or using IVF to conceive, just as examples. Another law that ensures that LGBT student groups at religiously affiliated schools can't be banned from using their own school's facilities and services. D.C. lawmakers and residents have consistently stood up to protect and expand access to, progress, to progressive issues, including reproductive health care, abortion, and birth control access. Just recently, D.C. passed a law that protects residents, and the mayor signed, <laughs> a law that protects residents' ability to access birth control without out-of-pocket costs, protecting that access no matter what havoc the Trump administration or anti-choice congressional Republicans reek with our nation's health care law. If only more cities and states were taking strong, progressive approaches to governing and helping women get ahead in the process, we don't need Republican politicians meddling in our democratic process. We don't need Republican politicians meddling in our doctor's offices. And we don't need Republican politicians meddling in our lives in D.C. or anywhere else. We at NARAL will continue to mobilize our network of more than a million activists to protect the progress we've made in D.C. for women's rights. Thank you to all of you for advancing reproductive freedom and for fighting to save D.C. home rule. Thank you, Thank you Kate Ryan. I'd like to ask uh, Kate Bell of the Marijuana Policy Project to come forward now. Thank you. Um, the idea that the government closest to the people governs the best is a core conservative principle. And the last time I checked, the uh, government closest to the people is probably the people themselves. 70% uh, of the 670,000 people in the District of Columbia supported Initiative 71, which legalized the personal use and personal cultivation of cannabis here in the district. The only reason that it didn't include uh, regulated stores where you could also purchase marijuana is because it couldn't, since it couldn't appropriate funds, because at the time we didn't have budget autonomy. Um, there was an attempt to block Initiative 71. Um, it failed. Um, and I will take this moment to thank Mayor Bowser for being one of the people who stood up for the will of her constituents to make sure that it went to a, in, into effect. 
Um, but it is not perfect because right now we have people who are able to possess cannabis, who are able to grow it, who are able to give it away, but there's nowhere to purchase it. And this means that DC is missing out on three things, testing, taxes, and jobs. So consumers don't know what they're purchasing. They don't know how potent it is. They don't know what uh, contaminants are in it because it's not a regulated system where it can be tested. Uh, D.C. is missing out on millions of dollars in tax revenue that could be used for all sorts of things, such as perhaps improving our infrastructure, which, by the way, would directly benefit members of Congress who come to D.C. on a regular basis. And then the third thing is jobs. Uh, having a lawful regulated cannabis industry would create lots of good new jobs for the residents here in D.C. So a recent poll was done that shows that 76% of Americans believe that the federal government should respect states' marijuana laws. D.C. is not alone here. There are eight states that have legalized marijuana for all adults. Now, Congressman Harris won his last election with 68% of the vote, which is pretty impressive, but it's not as high as 76%. Um, and the folks around here ought to know that it's pretty tough to get 76% of Americans to agree on anything. Um, so I hope that they will listen to their own constituents as well as the residents of District of Columbia and allow D.C. to move forward to tax and regulate marijuana for adults. Thanks. Thank you, Kate Bell. I hope they <laughs> listen to the Marijuana Policy Project. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Kimberly Callanan of Compassion and Choices to come forward. Thank you, Congressman Norton and Mayor Bowser, for your leadership to protect the legal rights of D.C. residents to govern themselves um, and for your much needed um, protection to help to make sure that D.C. residents have their own, can uh, make their own health care decisions. I'm the Chief Program Officer at Compassion and Choices. We are the nation's largest national organization that's committed to ensuring that people have autonomy at the end of life. In February, Mayor Bowser signed DC's Death with Dignity Act into a law after an 11 to 2 vote by the City Council. This law gives mentally capable, terminally ill adults with a six months or less to live, the option, merely the option, to get a doctor's prescription so they can die peacefully in their sleep should they choose. Even though two-thirds of D.C. residents support the law, Congressman Andy Harris and Senator James Lankford have threatened to block funding to implement it. That's two-thirds of D.C. residents who support this law. Blocking funding to implement the law would violate the autonomy of D.C. residents and cause needless suffering for people who are terminally ill at the end of their life who desperately need this peaceful end-of-life option. It would also set a very, very dangerous precedent that could embolden congressional opponents to ban medical aid in dying nationwide. Such a ban would invalidate laws in six states representing 18% of the nation's population where medical aid in dying is currently authorized and has been practiced safely for 30 combined years. As Congresswoman Norton earlier talked about those important congressional votes in states where medical aid and dying is authorized, I want to be sure everybody knows what states those are. That's Oregon, Washington, Montana, Vermont, California, and Colorado. This proven safety record explains why doctors support medical aid and dying by a two-to-one margin 57% to 
If Congress made the unprecedented power grab to ban medical aid in dying nationwide, it would risk the wrath of its constituents. Seventy-three percent of Americans support this end-of-life option, including 55 percent of weekly churchgoers and 60 percent of conservatives. Medical aid in dying is a bipartisan issue. Everybody dies and everybody needs this peaceful option. Please, Congress, make sure that D.C. residents have this option. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kimberly Callanan. I, I, I want to mention as well uh, that according to uh, statistics we have seen, uh, most who have this option don't take it. So that tells you that it, uh, they go to hospice instead. So it tells you the comfort it must have brought to dying people to at least know that they had the option and to choose, and the operative word is choose not to take it. I'd like to ask uh, Christian Hain, Hain of the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence to speak at this time. My name is Christian Hain, and I'm uh, the Legislative Director at the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. So. I'd like to thank my Congresswoman, Eleanor Holmes Norton, for um, having us here today for this co important conversation. Um, and it's, you know, really frustrating that year in and year out, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton has to invite us here to have the same discussion over and over again, because um, unfortunately, uh, representatives who uh, are representing states from Kentucky and Ohio and Texas and Florida continually to continue to attack DC's gun laws. Um, and these attacks, they ignore the simple fact that DC's gun death rate is below the national average, whereas their home states have uh, gun death rates that are above the national average. And as an important distinction uh, to remember, because if these members of Congress are concerned with the epidemic of gun violence, and they should be, Every day, people are dying. Every day, in every place in America, people are dying as a result of access to guns. Um, you know, today, 92 people will, will die because of easy access to guns. Um, if they're really concerned, then there are ways to do it, but going about it the way they are is, is simply not it, and, and taking away the power from D.C. to be able to protect their residents is not going to help, help any of that. I know, I have seen firsthand... Um, the dangers of, of giving dangerous people access to deadly weapons. In 2005, my parents were returning from a, a holiday vacation they had together. They had an, an amazing time, an amazing weekend, and they were returning a boat to my dad's best friend's house. And, and uh, when they were returning the boat, a man came to kill my dad's best friend. And because my parents were there, he turned the gun on them as well. My dad survived being shot three times, and my mom was instantly killed. Um, if these members of Congress want to protect Americans as they should, there are ways we can do that. But making it easier for dangerous people to have access to deadly weapons is not the path forward to do so. D.C. has, has worked really hard to have smart gun laws, sensible gun laws that, that protect our residents, which is why when, when guns are commonly used in crimes here, they're coming from out of state, usually from states with really weak gun laws. And... You know, the proposals that we are fighting year in and year out here on the Hill uh, with the Congresswoman, you know, are, are fights that are just nonsensical. They're trying to allow assault weapons and, and high-capacity magazines to be carried loaded in public here in the, in the nation's capital. They're trying to permit individuals who have been convicted of, of violent misdemeanors to be able to carry those so, same weapons in public. They're trying to make it so that strangers can buy guns from other strangers in the district without even undergoing a background check. Um, it, it, th these are not ways that we can save district residents. This is not going to make the district safer, as, as the mayor said earlier. These are simply attempts to get some street cred with the gun lobby that is, that ha and, ha and for a bunch of people that don't really care about what happens to us here in the district. So this is why our organization um, passionately 
pleads to the legislators here in this building, in this, in this city, to, uh, to allow D.C. to reasonably legislate laws that save district residents, um, do it this, this appropriation season, do it next appropriation season. Let's stop having this conversation because um, it's just not, it's not fair to us. And, and the result isn't numbers or figures. It's not tax money. It's not anything. The, the result here is people's lives. You know, the result here is, is, is other families that have to go through what I went through 12 years ago and that I continue to go through today, the trauma, the sadness of, of never being able to call up my mom ever again. So we just need to do more, and, and, I, and I urge Congress to, uh, to do their best to give us the ability to do so. Well, I wish every member of Congress could hear your story, Christian. And thank you very much. Uh, from the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, I'm going to ask Cynthia Finley if she would come forward now. Thank you, Congresswoman Norton and Mayor Bowser, for having me here today to talk about D.C.'s Nonwoven Disposable Products Act, Products Act. My name is Cynthia Finley. I'm Director of Regulatory Affairs for NACWA, the National Association of Clean Water Agencies. NACWA represents public wastewater utilities across the country, including D.C. water. Utilities are increasingly having problems with wipes and other consumer products that are flushed into the sewer system. Nationally, we estimate that wipes cost utilities up to a billion dollars each year, and the problem's only getting worse. These products do not break apart quickly like toilet paper does, so they end up clogging pumps, blocking screens, and causing problems with other wastewater equipment. I'm going to show you a couple pictures because I think with wipes, a picture really does say a thousand words. This is one of DC Water's pipes, completely clogged up with wipes. Utility workers are placed at risk of injury and illness when they have to clean out this equipment. You see here, this is a utility worker having to get these sewage soaked wipes out of a pump and clean it out. There can also be things like needles and stuff stuck in these masses of materials. So um, it's really not a job that we like any utility worker to have to do. Utilities also have to pay for the disposal of all of these tons, literally tons, of materials that come into their pump stations. So they have to fill up dumpsters and take them to landfills and pay for all that when they could have been disposed of directly into the landfill. Wipes also combine with fats, oils, and greases that end up in wastewater, and they form massive fatbergs that cause clogs in systems and sewage overflows. Although many products are flushed into the sewer system, including paper towels, feminine hygiene products, and dental floss, only wipes are labeled and sold as flushable when they actually are not flushable. The wipes sold in the U.S. and labeled flushable do not break apart quickly after flushing, contributing to these billion-dollar problems that you see in sewer systems. The wipes that are not flushable, like baby wipes and cleaning wipes, are also not clearly labeled as do not flush, so consumers are confused about how to dispose of these products. These types of wipes are incredibly strong, and they wreak havoc on wastewater equipment. Several cities and states have considered legislation to deal with wipes, but D.C. was the first uh, city to develop really solid legislation that addresses both problems with wipes, and that's that flushable wipes don't break apart quickly enough to be safe to flush, and non-flushable wipes are not clearly labeled as do not flush. D.C.'s Department of Energy and the Environment, DOEE, is currently developing the regulations to implement this law, so they'll need to establish both a flushability standard and standards for labeling non-flushable wipes. NACWA and other wastewater associations have worked with the wipes industry on both of these issues. And we recently reached a consensus with the wipes industry on how non-flushable products should be labeled with a clear Do Not Flush logo on the top of the package. DOEE can directly adopt these labeling guidelines that have already been agreed to by the wipes industry. Currently, these guidelines are only voluntary, so there's nothing to force the wipes companies to use them. Unfortunately, the wipes companies have not been as responsible with their flushable wipes. And it seems that they want to protect their products rather than protecting the sewer system. Uh, we know that they could improve their products and make them truly safe to flush. Right now, there are several different types of wipe available for sale in Japan that break apart really quickly, even faster than toilet paper. So we know it can be done. The U.S. wipes companies should focus their energy on improving their own products rather than fighting D.C.'s common sense wipes law. We ask that Congress allow D.C.'s law to stay in place since it will help protect the sewer system that serves the nation's capital, including the wastewater produced right here in Congress. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Cynthia Finley. This was a new one for us. 
Uh, and I want our staff to get hold of um, those pictures, ugly as they are. I'd like to send them to members of the Appropriations <laughs> Subcommittee. <laughs> uh, last but certainly not least, because we wouldn't be here if we had the same rights as other Americans, I'm going to ask Bo Schuff of DC Vote to speak. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> good morning. Sorry. Uh, Congresswoman Eleanor Nor Holmes Norton, thanks for uh, having us to this event and including DC Vote in all of the work that you do. Thank you, Mayor Bowser, for joining us today and for your ongoing work to uphold DC values across the district and for your leadership on DC statehood. And thank you to the other organizations who are present uh, for joining in our efforts to protect the district. Uh, in fact, more than 51, I'm sorry, it's become my favorite number, um, but 56, 57, I'm now told, organizations, uh, national, regional, and local organizations representing millions of Americans from coast to coast have signed on to a letter uh, to Congress that we're delivering on their behalf today. DC Vote spearheaded this effort to demonstrate that both autonomy and statehood are important across the United States. These millions of Americans know that the only permanent way for us to stop these types of attacks on the right of district elected officials to set local policy for their constituents is statehood. The framers of the Constitution could never have imagined that the clause used to create the District of Columbia would be used for hundreds of years to tax millions of people without them having equal representation. It is the very tyranny they fought against in creating these United States. Furthermore, the United States, the members of Congress who passed the Home Rule Act could not have intended that future Congresses would circumvent the disapproval process they had created and usurp local control through budgetary riders. Neither the Constitution nor the Home Rule Act should be interpreted in ways that suppress the people of the district who call this place home. 670,000 people have the right to be fully and equally represented in the Congress of the United States. Our Congresswoman has done an amazing job representing and fighting for all of us, but she deserves a vote, and she deserves colleagues in the Senate. DC Vote, joined by these 56 other con organizations, call on Congress to keep your hands off DC and move towards supporting our autonomy through DC statehood. Thank you. Oh, the mayor has something for me that I'd like to uh, allow her to give. <laughs> we would like to present to you, uh, this is our D.C. tag. Uh, it, of course, has been amended to say end taxation without representation. Uh, and this is a symbolic tag that uh, also adds the message, leave us alone. <laughs> Down in front. I didn't know she, the mayor was going to give me this very timely <laughs> gift. <laughs> we, we'll, we'll also tweet this to members of the Appropriation Committee. <laughs> and I certainly want to thank Bo Schaff for his, his remarks and ask if any members of the press have any questions for our guests. Yes, please. Yeah. Hi, Jennifer with NBC Washington. Would you please stand so everyone can hear you? Jennifer with NBC Washington. Can you highlight what is the plan of how, uh, just the game plan at this point, uh, introducing bills, how are you going to all of these uh, wish, this uh, list of goals and wishes, how are they going to get accomplished in, uh, in this new congressional year? How are we going to go about keeping these, these riders from our appropriation? Uh, well, <laughs> if, if we were alone, it would be much harder. But what you're going to see happen is that the tentacles of these groups are going to spread to members of the House and Senate. And they're going to activate not D.C. residents, but residents in the districts where the members come from, residents in the states where the members come from, so that it's clear that the district does not stand alone. Meanwhile, we are prepared, if the bill goes to the Appropriation Committee, uh, to stand firm there. Now, you have to understand that in the House Appropriation Committee, uh, they could pass anything that says stop D.C. from doing everything. 
so we work hardest in the senate which represents in each case a wider swath of americans and is less inclined to simply take up a bill that the congress that the house is passed to overturn dc gun laws so we are activated as of now yes please stand up so that people can hear you um so I'm, I'm an appropriations reporter, and I know writers are the big subject of the day, but we didn't see an appropriation for the Federal Water and Sewer Authority. Usually they get $14 million a year. I know that this uh, the sewer issue is a huge deal, so I'm wondering uh, whether you've talked to the White House about the request at all and the lack of this appropriation. Uh, DC's um, water covers not just the district, but all the federal buildings. And we do usually get some funds for that. We, the, president, the president, my staff said, did propose $8 million. That's a little less than what we usually get. We were most concerned that they want to, that was in the president's bill, uh, a, uh, in, in, not in his bill, but in his skinny budget, there came forward the notion to privatize uh, D.C. water. We oppose that. We don't think it'll happen. I'm sorry, what did you say? The aqueduct, not D.C. I'm sorry, the aqueduct. I don't want to get the sewers and the water mixed up. <laughs> yes? Terry Pickett from The Daily Caller. You have to speak up a little bit. Terry Pickett from The Daily Caller. I'm curious as far as the uh, gun laws in D.C., how is it that citizens are supposed to take seriously that reasonable gun laws should be in D.C., but yet citizens of the district, for example, are being, their homes are being raided, for example, for spent shotgun shells, and then they're being put on trial for this. They don't have a criminal record, but then the, the police are going after them for very frivolous situations. Mayor Bowser, would you... Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the... Uh question is about I don't I don't know what that saying. question read I'm sorry 2014? 2014 okay I think the question refers to an incident in 2014 of which uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware but if the question is about reasonable gun uh, laws in the district is that our, our council has uh, reviewed this some gun laws have been challenged in the district laws have changed as a result of that uh, and we believe that we have a regime in place that uh, respects the Constitution uh, but also puts reasonable limits on uh, who's requesting licenses in the district so we we feel very um, good about uh, about where we are. Yeah. I'm curious at this point how you expect uh, President curious Trump at this point how you expect Donald Trump to react uh, if, if new riders are put into the appropriations bill and they make it to his desk. I expect the president to sign whatever comes before him. Have you discussed this with him? In Have we discussed this with Donald Trump? Yeah. That must be a rhetorical question. <laughs> we like to keep the, I'll ask the mayor to come forward with it. We like in the Congress to ride below the horizon. The president hasn't paid a lot of attention to the District of Columbia, and we hope he won't. To the extent that he has, he has introduced, I mentioned a rider. But he's also put D.C. tag in. He did put the usual money, sometimes less than we would want, into his budget. He could have decided no money for the District of Columbia. So he's doing a little better than I think D.C. residents expected. Mayor Bowser, I think sure. she had a question. Uh, one of, I think in my first meeting with the president, uh, I think that uh, you will recall that I mentioned when I went to New York that my point in going to New York was to introduce um, the incoming president at the time, who we were as Washingtonians, and to make sure that he recognized that uh, our relationship and um, the, the conversations we have with the Congress are different than those um, with the president. One of the biggest changes of having a Republican 
uh, in the White House is that we didn't have the same backstop that we did with President Obama uh, on a, a number of issues that came to, to the fore. So we just wanted to make it uh, clear to the president uh, that he had that ability. He could say something. He could say nothing. The best thing to do is to, to say nothing. So we were disappointed uh, that he chose to, to comment on the death with dignity bill. Uh, and in future conversations that we, we have with the White House, we'll emphasize that uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't need to get involved in that conversation. I don't. Yeah. For Mayor Bowser, Cameron Thompson of DCW50, somewhat uh, on topic. You're talking today about keeping Congress out of DC politics. Uh, down at the Judiciary Committee today, taking up several bills to, as they say, keep contractors out of DC politics. Your thoughts on the uh, so, uh, quote pay-to-play bills that are being heard today? I don't really know what the the, the uh, council is considering today, uh, but certainly we will follow the legislative process and see what comes out of it. Are there any questions on 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 what we're doing here today with the appropriation bill? <laughs> Uh, I want to thank you very much for coming. Uh, oh, I, I thought he put his hand down. <laughs> Hi, Alex Lee from the National Journal. Uh, the new chair of the Oversight Committee, Trey Gowdy, you signaled that he would like to be less involved with DC affairs than Jason Chavis, who left the leadership of the committee and Congress last month. Have you spoken with Congressman Gowdy yet? Mm -hmm. Do you expect him to stay true to his word that he wants to be less involved with DC? I really think that's an important question to be raised here. Uh, instead of Jason Chaffetz, we have a new chairman, mm -hmm. Trey Gowdy. <clears throat> He's been a good friend, a personal friend, but more importantly, a good friend of the District of Columbia. And he has had a, a tryout of sorts because he was chair of the subcommittee with jurisdiction over the District of Columbia. It also has jurisdiction over other issues. From the beginning, he made clear, to quote him, he did not want to be the mayor of the District of Columbia. Uh, and throughout his subcommittee chairmanship behaved in the most principled fashion. Now, that doesn't mean if there's an amendment on the floor saying let the district abortion laws remain intact, that he'll vote with us, but it does mean something very important to us, that he won't use his powerful chairmanship to go after the district the way, for example, that uh, Chairman Chaffetz uh, did. But to show you how forthcoming and respectful Trey Gowdy, our new chairman, is, Trey Gowdy came to me and said, uh, is Eleanor here? Came to my office and sat with me uh, to discuss the District of Columbia and what he did not intend to do and has gone on record again. Moreover, to show you his generosity and his his passion for democracy, instead of saying what hearings he was going to do, he asked me what hearings I would like him to do about the District of Columbia. Uh, one of the ones we are uh, contemplating, Mayor Bowser, is a bill, excuse, excuse me, a, a hearing to show the progress the District of Columbia has made since the end of the control board. We think Congress is unfamiliar with the extraordinary recovery brought on by Mayor Bowser and the, and, and, and the city council. And another reason we think it should be done is that the Congress aided in that recovery, not by interfering with the District of Columbia, but for example, by taking some state functions from the District of Columbia. We were the only jurisdiction in the United States that had to pay for state and local functions, and that was a primary reason that the district became uh, virtually insolvent. So that question is, is very important, was very important for us. I'm sorry I didn't even mention it. And it's been important enough to Trey Gowdy that he has taken it on his own to say that he will respect the District of Columbia. And in his subcommittee chairmanship, he proved that he means what he says. Any more questions? Thank you very much for Thank coming.